Welcome to Computer Networks. This is Lecture 23. First off, I wanted to remind you that there is homework due this week, homework 11. I hope everyone got a chance to make a decent progress on it. We're going to spend uh, quite some time this lecture talking about homework 11 to help you get started if you haven't gotten started already. And there is exam 2 coming up next week. It's on Monday. We're going to talk more about exam 2 in the next lecture. But at a high level, any material that we covered after exam one, that's a fair game for exam two. All right, let's spend a few minutes talking about homework 11. Um, in homework 11, we're asking you to implement a DNS server. And while implementing DNS server, there are some things we would like to learn how to do. And one of them is to read an RFC. RFC is defined internet standard for communication. Uh, for example, when you implement a client that interacts with a server that implements certain service, what is the messaging format? What's the communication protocol that they're supposed to use to interact? If there is no standardization, client is going to send a certain message to the server, and the server is not going to be able to interpret that because they have not agreed on a standard. But if both the client and the server implement the same protocol, the same standardized protocol, that a client can send a message to the server and the server can interpret that. Not only can this particular client can talk to the server, but another client implemented by a completely different company or a person should also be able to talk to the same server because they are using the same communication protocol. So that's the idea behind standardization. So in homework 11, what we're going to do is read an RFC that defines the messaging format used by DNS clients and DNS servers to talk to each other, how to send a query, how to send a response, and so forth. And after reading this RFC, we should be able to implement a client that can talk to a real DNS server. Or we should be able to write a server that can interact with a real DNS client. In homework 11, we're going to focus on, implement, on an implementation of a server. We're going to use a command that you're already familiar with for querying DNS servers. The name of the command is dig, D-I-G. We're all familiar with it. So what we're going to do is write a DNS server of our own that complies with the standard and we're going to use the command dig to interact with this server. So if we have implemented a server that implements the standard communication protocol, we should be able to use the command dig to interact with the server. If there is something wrong with the protocol, let's say we misinterpreted the protocol when we read an RFC, or if our implementation does not faithfully implement what the RFC specifies, then dig is not going to be able to interact with our server. For example, dig might send a message and we might not be able to understand it, or our server will send a message back to dig, for example, replies to queries, and dig will not be able to understand that. So we're going to learn all that. How to read an RFC, how to interpret it, and how to implement a service that implements the protocol specified by an RFC. So let's look at uh, the description of uh, homework 11 and uh, how it refers to the RFC. So this is the homework 11 description that we've all seen. It says that uh, we should implement this protocol that's defined in RFC 1035. So let's click there. And RFC is this document, text document. Um, a lot of the RFCs are very long. For example, this is 54 pages long. But depending on what you're trying to do, uh, you don't have to read all the pages in detail. For example, in this assignment, our goal is to implement a server, which is going to receive messages from the client, which is DIG. So at the minimum, we should be able to interpret the message that's coming in from the client. And in contrast to the protocols that we've implemented in the past, 
which were text-based protocols. This protocol that we're going to implement in this assignment is a binary protocol. What that means is earlier we used to be able to just print f the messages coming in and we would know exactly what the query was about or the reply was about. For example, in case of HTTP, we would see the word get and then URL, then we would know that the client wanted to fetch that URL. But in DNS, the messages coming in from the client to our server is not going to be text-based. It's going to be a few bytes and depending on the way each bit on, the, on those few bytes are set, the message is going to carry certain meaning. And we need to read this document to understand what all those bits might mean. So going back to this document, the part that we're primarily interested in is this messages section. Uh, recall our goal is to be able to understand the query sent by a client. That's the first thing that our server needs to do, right? So let's go to this section called header section format because our guess is probably that that section probably describes what the message is going to look like. The message is coming in from the client. So for that one, that one header section format. All right. So it says, all communications inside of the domain protocol are carried in a single format called a message. The top level format of message is divided into five sections, which are, some of which are empty in certain cases. So this diagram shows the overall structure of the message. There is a header. We don't know how many bits yet, but we know there is a header. And there is a question section, the question for the name server. So basically when a client sends a query to the server saying, I want to know the IP address of the name www.mydomain.com. So that question is going to be going, going to follow the header section. And there's the answer section. If uh, the server is sending an answer back to the client, we're going to put that answer there, and it's going to follow a header. And if there's a question, you know, it's going to follow a question. Otherwise, the answer is going to follow the header. So that is what we understand from this diagram. Clearly, this is not adequate. Uh, for example, we don't know how to interpret these bytes that constitute the header. We know that the part called header is going to come first to the server. So that we know just by looking at this diagram. But we don't know how, how to actually interpret the header. We don't know what kinds of information are available or included in the header just by looking at this diagram. The only thing that we know is header comes first. So let's continue reading this document, just scrolling down. Ah, there's a section called header section format. So this section gives us the details that we need to know to correctly parse the header that are sent by the client to our server, in our case. Uh, we are familiar to some extent with these ASCII diagrams. The first thing that we need to look at uh, when we see these diagrams is what, how wide is each row? Now, for example, in this case, we can tell that each row is 2 bytes wide, or 16 bits wide, 16 bit wide. You can tell that by looking at each bit that is numbered. For example, it goes from 0 to 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 0 to 15, so that's 16 bits. So the first item or the field in the header is something called ID. And we've talked about ID quite a bit in this class. Uh, for example, when we're discussing DNS and certain types of attacks one could launch on DNS, it was related to guessing the ID. So how wide is the ID? We should be able to tell that just by looking at this diagram. I mean, it turns out the ID field is 16-bit wide. So what that means is when we start reading this message coming from the client, let's say we're the server, we're starting to read this message, the first two bytes, that's 16 bits, so the first two bytes that we read 
that's going to be the ID, the ID sent by the, uh, sent by the client. Now, why do we care about uh, ID so much? It turns out we need this ID in order to send a response back to the client. Again, we've discussed this when we discussed DNS. When a query comes in that has ID, let's say, 5, and if you want to send a response to the client for that particular query, we need to put this ID to be exactly the same as the one sent by the client. That's the only way the client knows that this particular response corresponds to the query that was sent. The ID needs to match. That's the only way to know which response was sent in response to which query. So the first two bytes that we're going to read is going to be the ID. And uh, we're going to read the next byte, which is the third byte. So the third byte actually has a series of information. Each bit is going to carry a certain meaning. For example, what's the first byte, first bit on the third byte? It's something called QR. So let's see what QR means. Uh, the description here is says, here says that uh, QR, it's a one-bit field that specifies whether this message is a query or a response. So we're the server, we just read the first two bytes, we know that's an ID, we assign that to a variable, we read the third byte, we look at the first bit. First of all, do we know how to look at an individual bit of a byte? We go back to the bit operation that we learned in our earlier courses. So we all know how to use bit operation to set a bit or to read the value of a bit, right? Okay. So we look at this bit, and if it is a zero, it's a query. So when a client, a DNS client, sends a query to the server, the value of this bit is going to be zero. When we send a response back to the client, we need to set this bit to be 1. All right. Then the next field is called opcode, a 4-bit field that specifies kind of query, a standard query, an inverse query. Again, the details, uh, you probably don't need to get into the details of all these fields, but uh, just have to see if there is something relevant for very simple queries that we're going to answer. For example, our DNS server is going to be very limited in functionality. We're not going to implement all the possible functionalities uh, DNS server would have to implement. We're only interested in implementing the A query functionality. Right? For example, what's the IP address for the certain name? That's the only functionality that we need to implement. So there's opcode and there are various other fields that you might want to look at just to make sure you're not missing anything relevant. Now, so that's the header. It tells uh, the important information is ID and the fact that it's a, we need to be sure that it's a query. We look at that uh, bit. And there might be a few other pieces of relevant information. I encourage you to read this document and determine if they're relevant. And going back to the structure, so now we know how to under, how we understand how to interpret the header. Next, we need to go into the question because the client actually sent this question saying, "What's the IP address of uh, the name you know, www.mydomain.com, for example?" So that information is going to be included in the question section, which follows the header. So here's the header. So uh, header is going to, so first of all, how many bytes are going to be in the header? We should be able to tell that just by looking at this diagram. Each row is how many bytes? Two bytes. Okay. So once we parse the header, we move on to parsing the question format, which follows the header format. So if we look at the question format, we realize that it has three different sections. Again, the width of uh, each row, in this case, is 16 bits. It turns out QName can have variable length. You can see. 
Uh, let's read what the what the pair the first paragraph says. So it says the question section is used to carry the question in must queries. That is the parameters that define what is being asked. So if uh, we are asking the IP address of mydomain.com, so that information is going to be in the question section format. So the first question is how do we put this name? You know, www.mydomain.com. How do we put it there? That's the first question. And uh, once you figure that out, we need to tell the domain name server that, okay, here's the name, and we are interested in the IP address. So that's the second part. So first, uh, let's uh, focus on the first part, which is how do we put this name, which is www.mydomain.com in the question format. So let's look at the description of QName. It says a domain name represented as a sequence of labels where each label consists of a length octet followed by that number of octets. So what this is saying is a domain name consists of a sequence of labels. For example, www.mydomain.com, it turns out that name consists of three labels separated by dots. So the first label is www. Second label is my domain and third label is com. So what's the length of the first label? It's three. It's www. So what QName section is going to have is the number three representing the length. Right. So it's going to say 3 and www. And what's the length of the second label, which is my domain? It's M-Y-D-O-M-A-I-N. That's eight characters, right? So we're going to put the number 8 and then my domain. Because so far we have 3, www, 8, M-Y-D-O-M-A-I-N. And then finally the third label is com so we're going to say 3 com so that is what we're going to find in q name if we had to you know type it up it would be something like 3 www or the ascii value of that 8 my d o m a i n 3 com so this is what uh, your program is going to receive in the q name section 3 the ASCII values for www, 8, my domain, M-Y-D-O-M-A-I-N, 3, C-O-M, and then it's going to be terminated with a zero. Uh, for example, if you go back to this description, it says the domain name terminates with a zero length octet for the null label of the root. All right. So that is what we're going to read in Q name. Of course, this, uh, uh, this Q name section is going to be different depending on what the client is asking. For example, if the client is asking what's the name of www.yourdomain.com, the first level is going to be the same, the second level is going to be different. And that's going to be reflected in what you read in QName section. Okay, so that's QName. So now we know how to read QName. Next, there is this field called QType. So let's see what it says here. Q type, a two octet code which specifies the type of the query. The values for this field include all codes valid for a type field, together with some more general codes which can match more than one type of RR. So let's look at the type field. We can just do a search for Q T I P E. Turns out there is a section called Q type values, so that's a good sign. So Ah, there, there we go. So here are all the Q-type values. And the only Q-type value that we're interested in is the A-type, which is the address. Type A, value 1, and meaning is a host address. Because we're, our server is only going to be able to answer this one type of query, which is, what's the host address for this name? So we expect that Q type that we will read in the incoming query is going to be of type A, but it's a good idea to verify that. So let's go back to this section. 
So we're going to read this name and, we, and we're and we going to have the number 1 in Q type. Note that Q type is how many bits wide? 16 bits, two, which is 2 bytes. So if we actually print one byte at a time, we're going to read in after Q name, we're going to read 0 and then 1. It means 2 bytes, right? Okay. Finally, there's Q class. Let's see what Q class is. A two octet code, so it's a two byte code here, that specifies the class of the query. For example, the Q class field is IN for the internet. So let's look at Q class. So it says Q class fields appear in the question section of the query. Q class values are a superset of class values. Every class is a valid Q class. Okay, so we need to actually look at class values which appears in the section just preceding the Q class values section. And here are the Q class values. So if you see one, that means it's the internet, and there are a few other legacy classes. So let's go back to this section. So in summary, we're gonna see the sequence of labels that constitute the name that the client is asking us about, and this is what it roughly might look like: three www, eight my domain, three com, zero. That's the termination. Then we're gonna read zero and one. Or that's the only query that we're interested in. If we receive any other type of query or, or any other queries with a different Q type, uh, we will not be able to answer that. So we expect zero and one, and a Q class of uh, 0, 1 as well. All right, so that's how uh, we can read this RFC to understand the format in which the DNS client, in our case, the dig program, is going to send to our server. So how do we actually write a server? In order to get started, it's uh, uh, reasonable that we start with any socket server that we already know how to write. And we've written these kind of servers many times. Uh, we're going to use UDP server, of course. So what I did was I started uh, with this program called Listener that comes with the socket programming guide that we distributed in the beginning of the class. It's the stock listen, um, UDP socket server. Uh, this is what the program looks like. Just uh, scrolling down, just to look through the look through the various sections. You get the address. You bind. You create the socket before binding, of course, and and then you read some bytes from the socket, and it prints that I uh, got this many bytes over here. To really be like this. Okay, it could be either way. And it prints the uh, buffer, which is the bytes that you read. So, can you tell me why this code will not work? Why can't we just print the buffer as string? We said that in the beginning of the class, right? This is not a text-based protocol. The values coming in, they're arbitrary binary values. There's not necessarily an ASCII, uh, there's not necessarily a readable text representation for those bytes. And uh, we're not really interested in the character representation. What we're interested in is what's the value of each bit in the various fields. So this is not going to work. So the first thing that uh, we're going to do is write a little snippet of code that will print each byte as it comes in. So this is going to be our DNS server. And as we studied earlier in this RFC, we're going to get a bunch of bytes corresponding to the header first. right? And then question. So um, we're going to receive a bunch of bytes and the first section of these bytes it's going to be the header and then the second section is going to be the question section. 
So let's uh, write some code here, but um, just to make this process faster, I've already written some code. I'm just going to copy this code from uh, here. Okay, let's see what this snippet of code does. Uh, we already have the code, uh, it came with the file, to receive from that socket, you know, the number of bytes uh, that uh, are ready to be received, which is non-bytes. Now, all this code does is iterate through those bytes, and it prints each byte. It's okay, one byte per line in uh, hexadecimal. All right. So let's uh, compile this. Okay, and uh, let's see the port number on which. So we're running this on port ten thousand and one. Okay, that's great. And uh, here's the code that we just added. So we're just gonna run this. As we indicated earlier, we're gonna use this program called Dig to send some uh, messages. To, to this DNS server. But first of all, just to just to remind you, for example, uh, you know what what is Dig all about? Well, it tells us uh, what um, let's say what the IP address is for a given name. This is a DNS client. For example, if I type dig www.edu, it goes to the default DNS server, and it tells me that okay, answer section uh, www.edu. Here's the IP address. That, that's what dig is about. This is just uh, to remind us uh, what, what it is about. In dig, we can specify a specific DNS server we want to use. So in our case, we're going to use bayou.cs.uh.edu because that's where I'm running my DNS server, which is on my right-hand side window. right? And uh, this uh, DNS server does not run on a standard port. If it ran on a standard port, uh, we just specify the server and the message will go to the standard port. But uh, in this case, we're running our DNS server on port 10001. This is just like HTTP, right? If you just go to you know www.uh.edu, you don't need to specify the port number. By default, it's 80. But if you are running a web server on a port other than 80, then you have to specify the port number. All right, so our DNS server is running on port 10001. And finally, what's the name that we want to ask about? Let's just say hello, just to see what happens. Ah, there we go. So on the right-hand side, we actually got this message. So uh, the first two bytes, their ID and uh, Um, let's see where okay here so we can we can see that this is this is where the question section starts all right it says five so there's only one label in the question that is that we send which is just hello this is just an example and if you look at six eight six five six 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 c six f that's actually the ASCII code for each character in that name. Uh, for example, hex 68, that would be an H. And it's terminated with a zero, and um, there is Q type and Q class, which are all, both two bytes, two bytes each, and that's zero one and zero one. So this makes sense. Right? So now we understand how, how to interpret each byte that comes in. A quick question. So, how, what would the message look like if we do www.mydomain.com? Let's start the server again. All right. If we go here, so this is exactly like what we had predicted. So, there are three labels in this name www, so it says three and then seven, 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 seven. That's in hex. I'm printing everything in hex here. Then second level of length eight, and then finally third level of length three, and then there's a zero termination for the root. Okay, so this makes sense. So now 
when we receive a query from the client, we know how to interpret the query. For example, we know that this is a query by looking at the third, the first bit, right, of the third byte, and we also uh, know what the client is asking. For example, the client is asking what is the address of www.mydomain.com. And based on that information, we should be able to return some IP address. So let's say, for uh, just to try it out. So let's say you know we know what uh, the client is asking. Now we want to send some um, answer back. So let's say we want to say that okay, the IP address is one dot one dot one dot one. Let's say that's the message that we want to send back. So one way to do that is by is by, for example, copying 1.1.1 to a string buffer and then saying, okay, send to uh, to the same socket because the client is still listening. And then we just send with that call, send to call. Uh, do you think this will work? Let's think about this for a moment. Our server is going to be sending this message to the client. This is a DNS client. In our case, big program. My guess is this is not going to work because the client is also expecting the message to come back in a certain format. And that format is also specified in the RFC. For example, all the DNS messages they have to start with the header. And header has in a certain number of bytes, and each bit. In uh, the header, it's going to carry some meaning. For example, you need to have the right ID, and you need to tell the client this is actually a reply, so on and so forth. If you just try to send 1.1.1.1, I don't think the client will be able to interpret this because it's expecting the message to come back in a, in the format specified by RFC, and we're here we're just sending the text 1.1.1.1 without really using that format. So I don't think this is going to work even though we're trying to send this address to the client. So let's actually see if that's the case. So let's uh, compile this and uh, let's uh, run it. So the only difference in what we're running now and what we were running earlier is now we are sending 1.1.1.1 back to the client. Right? Alright, so I'm going to send uh, this message uh, to the server saying what's the IP address of www.mydomain.com and this server is running on Bayou at port 10001. So let's see what happens. Okay, let's look at it on the server side. On the server side, it looks the same as last time, nothing unusual. So that's good. That means we're able to receive the message from the client successfully. So that's great. But if you look at it on the client side, here is a here is a message. It says warning, short, less than header size message received. So what this means is the client could not interpret the message that was sent by our server. And why is that? Well, that's because we didn't send the message in the right format. When we send a reply back to the server, as we learn from this document, we need to first send the header. And the header has certain information we need to send that first. Then there is the answer section. The answer section is going to have its own format. We can't just send one but one but one but one. And it's going to be different from question uh, format. Right? So I encourage you to read this document to understand the format in which you should send the answer is back to the client. But at least the question part, I think you have enough information to make a quick progress in parsing the header based on uh, the little demonstrations that we just did. All right. Let's go back to the slides. So to summarize, 
We're going to implement a DNS server, and in doing so, we're going to learn how to read an RFC and implement an RFC-compliant network service. So that's what we're trying to do. And one thing uh, interesting that you could do if you're doing most of this development in your own laptop is actually run your DNS server on a standard port on your laptop. And in network configuration, you could say the DNS server that you want to use is at 127.001. That way, when you go to your browser and type some address, the query is first going to go to your server. You can want to try that out. That'd be, that'd be interesting to try that out. All right. Mo uh, moving on to today's topics. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion of uh, various topics related to security. And uh, we're going to conclude our lecture, or our discussion of security today, because we have some more material to cover next week on policy and also some exam review. All right. So first, uh, here is a basic problem in the internet, which is it's very easy for someone to snoop your message and read what you're sending across the public internet. And you've done that yourself, right? In one of the homeworks, you learned how to log all the packets that are being transmitted in the neighborhood, even the packets that you are not sending yourself. So the question is, even if you're using the public internet, even though everyone sees that you're sending packets, how can we encrypt the message? Or how can we prevent other people from reading the messages that we are sending? So that's the, that's the first type of security that we desire in network communication. And it turns out uh, this is a well-studied problem. People have worked on this problem for a very long time and one of the easiest things um, that uh, we could do is uh, whenever we want to send the message A we send a C. We basically go to the next next alphabet. right? That's called substitution cipher. So uh, next time you need to send the letter C to your friend you don't send C because everyone is going to know that you're sending a C so you send an E instead and uh, so on and so forth. So every time you need to send a character, you send uh, the next next character. Okay, so that's great. What does your friend need to know if your friend is to decode that message carefully? Your friend needs to know the number of steps by which you have shifted the, the character. In which case, uh, in, in this case, uh, A is really encoded as C, right? You, shifted by 2. So your friend needs to know the number 2. So that's an example of a key. Some information that you need to encrypt the message, in which case, uh, in, in, in this case, uh, you know, A got converted to C, and you need that key to decode the original message. Your friend needs to know the number 2, which is the number of steps that you have to decrement. The received byte to decode the original message. So that's called key. So basically you need a key to decode that message. The challenge is how can you tell your friend that the key is two without telling other people? So that's, that's really the challenge here. So now we understand the concept of key. Uh, I want to tell you that there are two different types of encryption systems depending on the types of key, key you, might, you might use. The first one is called symmetric. That uh, now we're going to talk next, talk about next. In symmetric key encryption system, both the sender and the receiver, they use the same key. In our earlier example, both you and your friend both have to use the word, uh, we use the key too. So the encryption algorithms that we use in the internet, they're of course more complex than 
the encryption scheme that we just described, which is just shifting its character, but the idea is the same. You use the key to encrypt the message using some mathematical operation, and it is almost impossible for you to decode the message unless you know the key. That's the idea. So what are some of the challenges for such symmetric key encryption systems? Let's think about that. Well, the first challenge is how do you distribute the key? It's going to be pretty challenging. Let's say your friend lives uh, far away and the only way to reach him is by email. So are you going to put the key in the email and send it to your friend send it to him or her? If you do that, somebody could intercept that email and know the key and uh, your messages are going to be compromised. Somebody else is going to be able to decrypt your message. So I, I hope you appreciate uh, the difficulty in sharing the key. So that, that's a challenge. Another challenge is, you know, how many keys should you use and what happens if the key is compromised? So let's say you and your friend you have come up with a very secure way to share the key. So nobody else in the world knows that you and your friend are using the key of two. For some reason, let's say the key got compromised because you're not very careful in where you're storing your key. For example, you wrote down the key on a post-it note and put it on a monitor and somebody read that, right? So let's say your key is compromised. What happens to all the messages that you might send in the future? Somebody else who also has the key is going to be able to decrypt that message. So that's a problem. That's a big problem. All right. What's the solution? Well, the only solution that will really work is if you can use a new key for each message that you send or each character that you send. Then even if the key gets compromised, you only that uh, adversary is going to be able to decrypt just that one character. So let's say I need to send a sentence that has, let's say, 20 characters. If I encrypt each character using a separate key, then even if the bad person was able to compromise you know, one of the keys, let's say the, the, the bad person got to know about one of the keys I'm using, only one character is re revealed, the 19 characters are not revealed to that bad person. So it seems like the best way to use symmetric key encryption is if uh, you're using sufficiently large number of keys so that even if uh, one of the keys is compromised, the uh, rest of the transmissions are still secure. For example, if you, if you need to send a lot of messages, what you could do is you could share a large number of keys in advance and use those keys only once. All right, and here's a pictorial representation of how a symmetric key encryption system works. You start with a plain text, which is the text before encryption. That's the that's the phrase that we use to describe that. We encrypt that plain text using secret key, and out comes cipher text. Cipher text is basically the output of the encryption algorithm. So if I just look at the cipher text, I will not be able to know what the original message is. There is no way for me to know that because it's already been encrypted. And finally, when the cipher text travels over the public internet, you know anyone can read cipher, cipher text. When it gets to the receiver, the receiver is going to apply the decrypt function with the secret key. Only the receiver and the sender know the secret key. So the receiver should be able to correctly decrypt the message and out comes plain text, which is the original message. So that's the brief overview of symmetric key encryption system. There's another type of encryption system that uses two different keys. So earlier, whenever you generated a key, you just generated one key and shared that with your friend. Here, 
what you do is when you, when you generate a key, you generate a key with two components. One, and then you use one component to encrypt and another component to decrypt, and it's a key pair. You have two components, and it turns out you can keep one yourself and guard it. Don't give that away to anyone, and you can give away the other component to the public. And that's why this scheme is also called a public-private key pair. So out of the key pair, you publish your public component of the key to everyone so that they know what your public key is, but you keep your private key yourself. Don't show that to anyone. You need to keep it secure. So once we have the system, what we can do is if uh, Alice, let's say, wants to send a message to Bob, she can fetch Bob's public key. Why, why, can't, why is it that she can fetch Bob's public key? Because Bob has published this for anyone to read. And she can encrypt the message using Bob's public key and send it to Bob. Anyone can read the ciphertext. But to decode this message, you need Bob's private key. If you don't have Bob's private key, you cannot encrypt this message. So does that, does that make sense? Basically, if you encrypt a message using someone's public key, only that person will be able to decrypt that message because only that person has the private key corresponding to the public key that we use to encrypt the message. Here's a pictorial example. The sender is going to encrypt the plain text using the receiver's public key. And we send it across the public internet. Anyone can read the ciphertext. Can they decrypt this message? No, because in order to decrypt this message, you need the private key corresponding to the public key that was used for encryption. In this case, we use the receivers, this particular receiver's public key to encrypt the message. So only this receiver will be able to decrypt this message because only that receiver has the corresponding private key. Of course, we're assuming that the receiver keeps the key secret. If the receiver shares this private key with other people, then they're going to be able to decrypt the message as well. All right? And it works in reverse direction as well. Uh, for example, the same person as the receiver from our earlier example, that person could encrypt the message using private key and send it to everybody. We're not sending the private key, just the message that is encrypted using the private key. And other people can decrypt that message, right? Because with the public key corresponding to that private key, and everybody knows what that person's public key is. And why do we want to do that? It turns out this is a good way to verify that this message was actually written or sent by that person. Because if we're able to decrypt a message using a public key, it is necessarily the case that the message was sent by someone who had the corresponding private key. Other people could not have sent that message, unless they know that person's private key, of course. So if we receive a message and we're able to decrypt that message using a public key, it is the case, or it must be the case, that this message was originally sent by someone we had the private key corresponding to the key that we used to decrypt. All right, so here are some other um, types of security that uh, we care about when in communication protocols. Uh, the first one is we need to be able to know if a message has been garbled or tampered with in transit. It's called integrity. Send a message, I send an email to my friend and my friend needs to know 
if uh, that email is the same email that I sent originally or has it been tampered with in transit how can we design a system that would assure my friend that this email is actually the original email that I sent and it turns out we can use this idea of cryptographic hashes so let's say we use a hash function that is publicly known let's say just for the sake of example we're gonna use this hash function called MD5 what we could do is we send a message because we're not trying to encrypt the message right now my friend just needs to be sure that I actually sent this message right so we send the message we send the message in the public internet it doesn't matter if other people can read it what we next need to do is also send a hash of this message that I sent to my friend in a secure way it's just like saying okay here's the email I send an email to my friend and I call my friend and say okay I sent you an email and the email that I sent you actually has you know five paragraphs and let's say my friend receives the email and it has you know seven paragraphs and my friend knows there is something fishy right it's the same idea here I send an email and I send the hash of the email to my friend in a secure way and if my email was not tampered with in transit it should be the case that the hash matches what uh, the message or, or my friends should be able to compute the hash of the message and then see if that matches the hash that I sent just like in the example that I gave my friends should be able to count the paragraphs in the email and real and compute the number of paragraphs and see if that matches the number of paragraphs I claim there is in that email right so what the receiver can do is compute the hash when the receiver receives the message and see if that computed hash matches the hash that I sent using a secure way here's an example let's say I have a message to send plain text I send it over the internet but I also send a hash in this example we're calling an MD5 digest to the receiver so when the receiver receives the plain text message the receiver is also going to compute the digest of that message and the receiver can compare okay so the sender said, okay, here's the digest of the message, here's the hash of the message. But when I compute the hash of the received message, does it match or not? If they match, then I know the message has not been tampered with. But if they don't, then there is something fishy going on. It was tampered with, very likely. All right, I'll give you an example of a hash function. Um, these are readily available in at least a Unix platform for example you could uh, log into Bayou and uh, say okay, I want to compute this has a function or has value of the string hello md5 sum and that's the has value so essentially what I'm doing is sending the word hello to my friend and I'm also sending this has value this is the hash value, right? To my friend saying, okay, I just sent you a message and the hash of that value should be that string. The string here. So what my friend is going to do is my friend is going to, let's say on this side, my friend just received the I received a message that said hello. Right? So what my friend can do is compute the hash. okay so this is the hash of the message that I just received I don't know if the message was tampered with or not but my friend also received this hash that I sent using a secure channel and now my friend can compare okay does the computed hash value is it equal to the hash of the original message and if it is then I know it has not been tampered with right so let's let's do an example so let's say my friend received a uh, message that says uh, hello world 
because this message was tampered with in transit, right? I sent hello, but somehow uh, someone actually inserted the word world into the message before that message arrived at my friend. So what my friend is going to do is compute the hash. And here's the hash value. And my friend is going to compare this hash value with the hash value that I claim is the hash value of the original message. Do they match here in this case? Let's put this uh, in the side by side. And if we look at it, we realize that it does not match. Does that mean the message that I received is the message the message that my friend received is the message that I originally sent? No, because when my friend computed the hash and the received message, it did not match. The hash I claimed is of the original message. All right. So you can, uh, so there's another hash function that you can play with. Uh, for example, hello. So there's other hash. Uh, let's say Sha Watson. That's another hash function. And the hash will have a fixed size, regardless of the size of the string. For example, I could do a hello, let's say, pretty long string. Right. Same size, but different hash value. All right. So that's how we can check the integrity of a message. We are assuming we're, we're making two assumptions here. First of all, the hash of two different inputs, two distinct input strings, they don't collide. Or it's very hard to, it's very unlikely that they collide. That's what we're assuming. Let's say it was very easy for two strings to have the same hash. What's the problem in that case? Let's say the word hello and hello world had the same hash. What's the problem? Well, the problem is I sent the word hello, it got tampered with, my friend received hello world, and my friend is com going to compute hash. And let's say you know, I had you know, told my friend that I sent you a message and the hash of that message is x, right? Let's say, you know, hash of hello is x. Now my friend received hello world and he computed the hash and turns out uh, because hello as well as hello world, they produce the same hash. So my friend computed the hash of x. Turns out that matches, you know, what I said the hash is for the input string. So my friend thinks I actually sent hello world. But if it is the case that hello and hello world they don't output or hash of these two different strings they, it, it never produces let's say it never produces the same hash if we have two different inputs then my friend would be able to detect just by computing the hash and comparing that to the hash that I sent that these messages are different but if they collide it will be difficult for my friend to determine that uh, the message was tampered with all right. So that's the big assumptions that we're making about these hash functions. And fortunately, some of these hash functions that are well known, it's uh, very unlikely that two different strings result in the same hash. And that's a very desirable uh, property. And here's an example that we also showed earlier that uh, if you change a word or even a character, you're going to get a completely different hash. And we're in trouble if two different strings uh, result in the same hash. Because just by looking at the hash, we will not be able to tell that the input was different. All right. So let's look at another type of security-related function that we want in communication protocols. And that is called authentication. When we interact with servers in the internet, we, there are two things uh, we would like to do, right? We want to make sure that we're typing in our username and password on the right server. And from even from the server side, they need to know that we are the actual client. So those are the two requirements, and that's called authentication. 
So each, each side need to know the other side's public key in order to determine, in order to be able to authenticate that service. And I'll give an example of a protocol that establishes authentication. So let's say A comes up with some random number. We can call it a nonce x and it encrypts that nonce using b's public key and sends it to b so we're talking about a public private key encryption system so a generates a random number x encrypts that using b's public key and sends it to b over the public internet who can decrypt that message whoever has the private key corresponding to that public key, or the complementary private key. And who has that private key? Well, this is B's public key, so it should be the case, if B is doing the right thing, that only B should have access to B's private key. So basically what happened was B generated its public-private key pair, it kept, it kept its private key securely and disseminated its public key widely. So it sent this message to B. B should be able to decrypt this message because it has the corresponding private key and B can send this message back to A saying, okay, you sent X. So you send the X to back to A. So based on this message that uh, was received by A, A knows that B has the corresponding private key. Let's say A had accidentally connected to a different server called C. Would C have been able to send X back? No, because C would not have been able to decrypt this message. And if you can't decrypt that message, you have no idea what that X is. Right? So it should be the case that this message that you're actually connected to B. How do we know that? Well, B was able to prove that it has the corresponding private key. Right? If it was C, C would not have been able to decrypt that and C would not have been able to send a message saying you actually originally sent X. And you can use the same technique in the other direction as well. For example, if B wants to make sure that B is in fact connected to A, you could use the same protocol. B could send a message to A challenging A to decrypt the message using its private key. So for example, B could send a message to A encrypted using A's public key and only A should be able to decrypt that and when you get a message back, the decrypted message, then B knows for sure that B is connected to A. So that's how authentication works. So the next idea is called digital signature. So here the idea is when you send a message you want to be able to verify who sent that message we're not interested in encrypting that message which is preventing other people from reading that message anyone can read this message but we want to be able to verify who sent that message so that's the difference we're not really trying to keep the message secret here that's not our goal our goal is to be able to say okay this person actually send this message. And how might we accomplish that? Well, if Alice wanted to prove who she is, or let's say that uh, prove that okay, this message was sent by her, what she could do is encrypt that message using private key. Her private key. And let's think about this. So she encrypted that message using her private key. Now, who can decrypt this message? Remember, if you encrypt a message using a private key, anyone who has the corresponding public key should be able to decrypt that message. But everyone in the internet has Alice's public key, right? So anyone can decrypt the message. So this really proves that we're not trying to actually keep this message secret, but because everyone has public key and if we encrypt 
the message using the corresponding private key, anyone should be able to decrypt that. But here's the interesting property. It's true that anyone can decrypt that message. But if we're able to decrypt that message using that public key, it should be the case that the message originated from someone who knows the corresponding private key, in this case, Alice. So it's like a digital signature, right? It should be the case that Alice actually sent this message because no one else could have sent that message because we're able to, we're, the fact that we're able to decrypt that message using Alice's public key means this message actually originated at Alice's desk because nobody else has Alice's private key. Only the person who knows the corresponding private key could have sent that message. So there is no way for Alice to deny later that she did not send that message. So why is this uh, useful? In what scenarios? Let's think about this. Let's say Alice sent a message using the signature uh, scheme that we just described saying I'll pay you $500. She signs that or encrypts that message using her private key and sends a message to Bob and Bob was able to decrypt that message because everyone was Alice's public key, right? Including Bob. So Bob was able to decrypt that message. Could Alice later say that she never sent that message? No. Because the fact that we're, we can decrypt that message using Alice's public key means only Alice could have sent that message. Nobody else. So there is no way for Alice to prove that she did not send this message. Or the other way, the Bob can, Bob can prove that Bob can prove that this message, in fact, came from Alice. But there's a little subtlety here. For example, what would be a good defense that Alice might try to present? Well, she could say her private key was stolen. If her private key was stolen, then the person who stole the private key could have originated this originated this message. Right? So the only thing that we can prove is someone who had that particular private key originated that message, not necessarily Alice the person or the originated that message. So this brings us to this difficulty here, which is how do you tie a key to a real-world identity? Because they're not the same as we just learned. We know someone's public key, but uh, how do we know that someone is actually the person or the entity that we think? Uh, we know what that entity is. Let's say we have Amazon's public key, but how do we know for sure that it is the Amazon that we think that actually distributed that public key. It turns out we need a set of infrastructure, a set of mechanisms to tie the keys to real-world identity. And it's called public key infrastructure. And it's really a trust distribution mechanism. And one thing to keep in mind is trust doesn't mean you know, someone is honest. It's just a, we can verify the claim about who they say they are. Uh, for example, we can't uh, tell if a Amazon is not going to do something bad with their credit card information or not, but at the time of giving credit card to a particular website, we just uh, know, you know if they claim they are Amazon, uh, are we certain that they're, they're Amazon? And if uh, and I think it's uh, worthwhile thinking about how we manage trust in in, in our personal experiences. Um, I think the the basic mechanism that we use is some of our friends, you know, vouching for some other friends. I mean, that is probably the most basic mechanism that we use. For example, if we see someone new, we ask our friend, "Do you know this person? Uh, is, is he a good person or not?"
we might try to determine you know, if that person is good or not. I mean, that's the that, that is something that we could try if we can't then we can ask our friend or you know we can ask our friend to ask ask their friend we could just delegate some of these trust resolution as well but the tricky thing here is trust is not really transitive for example if uh, A trusts B and B vouches for C, and C vouches for D, are you going to really uh, trust the entire chain of trust? It's a, it's a difficult issue in the real world. You might trust, let's say, your parents and your siblings if they tell you, okay, this person is good, he's worth doing business with, uh, maybe your close friends, but how far are you willing to go? So it's not really a transitive relation. And it turns out uh, in communication protocols, we have developed two different models of delegating trust. Even though it's not transitive, it, it, it is somewhat transitive. For example, if uh, you trust your parents, and if your parents trust, uh, let's say, someone else, I think you trust uh, that someone else to some extent, right? So using similar models, uh, we have developed two different uh, models of delegating trust. And in this class, we're just going to focus on the second kind, which is uh, relying on trusted, well-known authorities. And it turns out that's the mechanism that we use to secure uh, our interactions with websites, secure websites. So here's the basic idea. So there are a set of public key public keys that we trust. And these are managed by entities called certificate authority. So there are this centralized entity at the root of our hierarchy of trust. Basically, these are the authorities we're always going to trust. Just like our parents, for example, if we trust our parents. So, there are these entities at the root of the hierarchy. What we're trying to do is develop a system that gives us confidence that when someone says, okay, this is my public key, that public key, in fact, belongs to that identity right that's what we're trying to do so for anyone to be able to publish their public key what they have to do is they have to go to this authority that everyone trusts and ask that so that certificate authority to certify that this is in fact the public key belonging to that entity for example let's say you want to start a company and you, you would like to offer secure services to your clients, what you need to do as a company is you need to go to the certificate authority that everyone trusts and tell the certificate authority that I would like to I would like you to certify my public key. And what this authority will tell you is well you need to prove who you, who you are as a company and they might ask you to send some paperwork like okay here's the company incorporation document here's my driver's license etc. Once the certificate authority is convinced that uh, you're a legitimate physical entity, then they will send a message to everyone saying, okay, here is the public key for this physical entity. And they're going to actually sign that message using this certificate authority's public key. So in a sense, what we're doing is we're delegating the trust to the certificate authority. So we're saying, okay, the certificate authorities are well behaved. Uh, we, we trust them to do due diligence whenever they certify public keys. And when they certify public keys, we're going to trust those public keys. If a certificate authority says, here's the public key for Amazon, we're going to trust that. So we're assuming that they're well behaved. Right. Now let's say 
there is a malicious Amazon. Let's say this is a this is a company that is trying that is trying to pretend that they're Amazon. Let's say this company goes to the certificate authority and says, "Okay, hello, uh, we are Amazon, and here's our public key." What is this uh, certificate authority going to do? Well, the certificate authority is going to ask uh, ask this uh, company, which is a bad company, that okay, well, prove that you're Amazon. We're happy to sign your public key, but uh, you need to prove that you're Amazon. Otherwise, we're not going to sign your public key. If this other company cannot prove that they're Amazon, they, their public key will not be signed by the certificate authority. And as long as we only trust the public keys that are signed by the certificate authority, then we, we're, we're, we don't have a problem, right? Because later, let's say, when we are when we are on a website, we get a public key from a server saying, hey, we are, we are Amazon.com, let's say it looks like Amazon.com website, and here's the public key. But when we look at the public key, we realize that this public key is not signed by a certificate authority that we trust. And at that point, we know that this is a server that we don't really trust. All right. So HTTPS actually uses this mechanism that we just discussed. For example, if you go to HTTPS colon slash slash www.amazon.com, um, HTTPS uh, signifies the protocol, which is used HTTP over SSL slash TLS. And it's very transparent uh, to the applications. For example, as a web page designer, you don't have to write any special HTML. Right. All right, so how does this actually work? Well, we have a browser uh, that sends a message to Amazon. Okay, we all know about SYN, right? That's, how you, that's the first message that you send uh, when you want to initiate a connection. What is Amazon going to send back to the browser? It's going to send SYNAC. It's going to act for that SYN. And the browser is going to act that SYNAC, so that's the ACK packet. And the browser is going to tell Amazon, okay, here are a bunch of uh, crypto protocols that I support. Which one do you want to use? Because we need to exchange this public key that we talked about earlier. And uh, Amazon says, okay, let's use uh, these protocols. And Amazon says, okay, here's my certificate. It told the browser, okay, here are the cryptographic protocols that we're going to use, and here's my certificate. And all of this is sent in clear text, right? Because we're not trying to hide what the certificate is like. Because a certificate is going to have a signature. If it is a proper certificate, it's going to have a signature from the certificate authority that we trust. So this is all in plain text. So inside the certificate, there's going to be a few key pieces of information. For example, it'll say, well, this uh, entity that has a certificate, that entity's name is Amazon, and here is Amazon's public key, and uh, various other information, for example, uh, URL. And most importantly, who signed that certificate? The name of the certificate's uh, signatory. And the signature, using the mechanism that we talked about earlier. It's signed by that certificate authority's private key. Why is it signed by certificate authority's private key? Well, if it is signed by the certificate authority's private key, anyone can verify the authenticity of this certificate using that signatory's public key. And everyone knows about the public key. Right? So if we are able to successfully decrypt this message using the certificate authority's public key, what that means is this certificate was actually signed by the certificate authority. Because nobody else would have signed the certificate, right? Because other people, the other parties, they don't know certificate authority's private key. All right. We can actually look at a real example of uh, what a certificate might uh, look like. For example, we go here. And let's uh, go to google.com 
you, you'll notice that uh, there is the word HTTPS and there is a lock sign here. So let's click there and it'll say uh, I can click here to find certificate information. And uh, it says, okay, here this certificate is for www.google.com. It is issued by this particular certificate authority. And it says this certificate is valid. What that means is the browser was able to successfully decrypt this certificate using this authority's public key. That means this, it is the case that this certificate was signed by that certificate authority's private key, right? When they issued the certificate. Let's look at the details here. For example, it says the country at which this entity exists is US, and here's the URL. And uh, and here is the entity that issued this certificate. There are various parameters, and here is the public key. All right, so you can you can look at uh, the certificate uh, you, by click, clicking here. And uh, what prevents someone from sending this certificate to your browser, even if you are going if you are on a different site? Let's say you launched another service called uh, let's say mygoogle.com, and uh, you just grab Google certificate because the certificate is out in the public, right? because Google actually sent this in plain text, it's easy for me to grab it. What prevents me, as an operator of mygoogle.com, to actually send this certificate to the browser? And they will think that uh, I'm google.com. Well, what the browsers also do is try to match the URL. Let's say, the, let's say my URL is mygoogle.com and if the certificate says this certificate belongs to the company that owns the URL www.google.com then it doesn't match, right? Because that certificate was supposed to be sent only by a service from www.google.com. So here are all the information that the certificate has and um, a browser based on this information can verify that you're actually connected to that service. and that this certificate is authentic by decoupling that with certificate authorities or the signatories public key. And here's an example. So this is, this is what a certificate might uh, look like. Let's say if we're talking about Amazon, right? It has the word Amazon. So this certificate belongs to Amazon and here's Amazon's public key. And this has been encrypted by the certificate authorities private key. Now, anyone who receives this certificate, and if it is a valid certificate, that means if it can be correctly decrypted using the certificate authority's public key, that we know that this public key, which is K-Amazon public, corresponds to the entity called Amazon. Now, here's a question uh, worth uh, thinking about a little bit, which is, when you bought a computer or when you install a browser, did you tell the browser which certificate authorities you trust? Because it seems like we're putting a great deal of trust on the certificate authorities to do the right thing. Right? So, when did you tell your browser, okay, here are the certificate authorities that you trust? This is a very serious delegation of trust. Because if you go to a secure website and if you um, because before you provide, let's say, your password and username, you want to make sure that you're connected to the legitimate site. And the way we're ensuring that right now is by looking, by looking, having the browser look at the certificate and make sure that the certificate is valid. Right? But ultimately, it depends on, you know, how well behaved the certificate authorities are. And you don't want to trust just about any certificate authority because certificate authority is just a piece of software. You could, you could run your own certificate authority. It's more than a piece of software, but uh, you know the point is you know, anyone could run a certificate authority because all you need is, is an ability to sign these public keys. And there's uh, software that's readily available 
to do that. Anyone can run this software. So question then again is, when did you tell your browser, okay, here are the certificate authorities that you trust? Because it seems like it's a very serious delegation of trust. It turns out we're relying on somebody else, somebody else's good intent to not tamper with the list of certificate authorities that we've trusted. So one of the attacks that uh, one could launch is tamper the browser's list of certificate authorities. So let's say there's some malicious software that goes into the browser's list of trusted certificate authorities and adds you know, one certificate authority that's, let's say, malicious. And that's a very dangerous thing because next time we go to a secure website, we might think that we're connected to the service that we think we're connected to because the browser says, okay, the certificate seems valid, but turns out we're using, we incorrectly or unintentionally validated a certificate that was issued by a certificate authority that we actually did not want to trust. But turns out this malicious software actually tampered with our list of certificate authorities that we trust. So these certificate authorities and their public is they're actually hardwired into the browser. Something to keep in mind. If it If, it, if a browser receives a certificate and it says, you know, it, the certificate was signed by certificate authority XYZ and if it can't find that certificate authority in its list of hardware certificate authorities, it's going to say, I can't verify, if, uh, verify the authenticity of this site and it can ask the user to continue. So you have to be careful when you say continue. And as we discussed earlier, in order to verify that the certificate is authentic, you try to decrypt that using the signatory's public key. And if it decrypts, then we know that the certificate is valid. And inside the certificate, there is Amazon's public key. And now we have a high confidence that we are indeed connected to Amazon and uh, we have a high confidence that the public key that we have is Amazon's public key. But we are assuming all this time that the signatory is trustworthy and our list of signatories is hardwired into the browser uh, that has not been tampered with. So once we've verified, that, uh, verified the authenticity of the certificate, we know the public key, right? So what the browser does is constructs a random session key. And now we know Amazon's public key with high confidence. It's going to encrypt that key, the session key, using Amazon's public key and send it to Amazon. Now, who can decrypt this message? Note that this message is encrypted using Amazon's public key. That means only the entity that has the corresponding public key can encrypt this message and in this case only Amazon has Amazon's private key. Right? So that means only Amazon can encrypt a message that was or decrypt a message that was encrypted using Amazon's public key. So Amazon says, okay, I got your message, I was able to decrypt this message using a private key, so we now agree that we're going to use K as our session key. And they're going to use symmetric um, cipher, the symmetric way of encrypting and decrypting a message, as we discussed earlier in this lecture. So here's one question. So why did we go through all this trouble just to, in the end, use symmetric encryption? It turns out symmetric encryption is computationally less intensive than the public-private key encryption that we talked about. So we use public-private key encryption to, neg uh, to negotiate and decide, okay, this is the key that we're going to use while communicating over plain text. Communicating uh, not over plain text but over the public internet without having to exchange the key. And once we've gone through the cryptographic protocol to exchange the key, 
then we can use that symmetric key for the rest of the communication. And finally, uh, just uh, one random topic in uh, type of attacks. Um, the type of attack that uh, we want to talk about today is called farming, which is the idea of getting the clients to believe that you're on site A while you're on site B. And that could be dangerous, right? For example, let's say you might log into your bank's account. You might think you're at uh, your bank's uh, website, but turns out you're in some other website that's trying to harvest your username and password. And it turns out you could launch this attack just by compromising the name resolution process. And what I mean by that is uh, compromising the way in which our clients learn about the IP address of servers. If I launch my browser and type, let's say, www.uh.edu, what the browser does is, first of all, ask the DNS server, okay, what's the IP address for this name? And this request is going to go to the DNS server. And uh, the DNS server is going to reply, and just like our DNS server is going to reply, saying, okay, the IP address is, you know, so and so. Great. And the browser is going to establish a socket connection to that IP address and get the page. That's how it works, right? What if the DNS server that uh, we sent a query to is a malicious DNS server? Well, the, DN the malicious DNS server could say, okay, here's the IP address, and turns out that IP address is not the IP address of uh.edu web server. It's, a, it's an IP address of some malicious site. In that case, our browser is going to connect to this malicious site, and we're in trouble. We think that we are at www.uh.edu, but we're not. We're connected to this malicious web server. So how real is this threat? This is what I wanted to discuss very briefly. Let's think about a scenario in which we have a laptop we carry around and once in a while we open it up when we're going from one building to another to check our emails, to browse some sites. So when we open up our laptop and power it up, we actually associate uh, with access point and we send a DHCP request, right? DHCP discover saying, okay, is there any DHCP server here? Because we need to configure our network. We need to know, you know what IP address I'm allowed to use, what's the gateway, what's the DNS server, etc., etc. So DNS server IP address is one of the network configuration parameters that we configure automatically using DHCP. So we go to a new place, and we send a message saying, okay, who is the DHCP server here? And we actually broadcast that. Right? If a bad person also has a laptop running, let's say, a DHCP server, that, that person could respond saying, I'm the DHCP server here. Because we're trying to discover, you know, who is the DHCP server here? And that laptop could say, okay, now I'm the DHCP server here. And here's the address for DNS server in this network. And what is my laptop going to do? Well, it seems like I received a message from a DHCP server. Here's the IP address I'm supposed to use. Here's the DNS server. So now, I think that I think I know what the IP address of the DNS server is. But that IP address that I received from the DHCP server, that's the malicious DNS server IP address. Now I'm locked into this DNS server. So whenever I go to let's say you know mybank.com this request is now going to go to this malicious DNS server because I configured my network address automatically using DHCP and there was this information saying that okay, the DNS server is this malicious IP. So next time I fire up my browser and go to mybank.com the browser is going to send a request to the DNS server which is now the malicious DNS server saying okay what's the IP address of mybank.com and the DNS server is going to say here's the IP address and that is going to be IP address of the malicious server 
And now we're connected to this malicious server and we might type our username and password and we're in trouble. So that is one way in which our uh, DNS information might uh, get compromised which could lead to this farming attack. And there, there is another way which is most of the Unix systems they have this file called hosts file. that lists IP address and the name. So what actually happens during resolution is if there is a name here in this file, you go, you use this name first. Name and IP address first and if, if it is not there then you go to the DNS server. So um, let's say let's say we have a malicious software that got installed on this laptop and let's say it's going to tamper this uh, file. It's just a text file slash etc slash host. And let's find the IP address of uh, www.uhedu. So that's the IP address. And let's see, what's the IP address of rice.edu? Okay, so that's the, that's the IP address of uh, rice.edu. Now let's say a malicious software that uh, actually manipulated this file and said um, one two nine dot seven dot nine seven dot five four that's the IP address of www.rice.edu this is just malicious software making just tweaking this file right now what's gonna happen when um, when I go to my web browser and try to go to www.rice.edu let's see what happens We go to University of Houston website. If we're just browsing university website, this is not a big deal. But let's say you know you went to your bank site, and let's say this file is manipulated by a malicious program. You could actually go to a server that you didn't intend to go to, and you might enter enter a user username and password, and the malicious. Uh, program would harvest your username and password and you'll be in trouble. So that concludes our discussion of uh, security in